The first question people ask is why does packaging matter? And I think it's fair to say that tobacco advertising and marketing are one of the most important risk factors for cancer in the world. So they're fundamental in terms of why people start smoking and, and why we saw that dramatic rise in smoking in the last century. And packaging has always been a central component of marketing. So it is the keeper, the fundamental communicator of brand imagery. So it's always been important. It's become more important as other forms of advertising have been banned or restricted. So now the pack has to do the job that the TV ad, that the billboard, that the print ad used to have to do. And so in countries like Canada, the US, many countries around the world, I would argue that the pack is the most important form of marketing that remains. And the pack is particularly important in terms of uh, recruiting new users. So we know that youth and young adults are more susceptible to brand imagery and marketing. So when you see packages like this, for example, with a pink flower on it, it's called Glamour, that's targeted, uh, we know, at young females, for example, not your 55-year-old smoker. Some of the trends are towards slim varieties. That's one of the fastest growing segments uh, globally. Um, we see different types of openings. We see different types of edges, beveled edges, innovations in the product that are communicated through the package. What is plain or standardized packaging? Australia was the first country to bring in plain packaging regulations in December 2012. And essentially what it does is it takes away the brand imagery, the colors, the logos from packs. And there's a standard color. So in Australia, it's olive brown. It doesn't restrict the number of brands or varieties. It just means that you can only print that brand name in a standard font color, a standard font size. Um, and Australia also standardized the size and shape of packs. So no more lipstick packs in Australia. They have to be a minimum pack size and shape. It restricts the branding and the marketing on the package. Certainly so far in Australia, uh, the government has argued that this is a reasonable public health measure and the courts have agreed. We're fortunate in the ITC study the government tracking measures. I'm from Australia and I'm very proud of Australia's achievements in tobacco control. For many years we've been one of the leaders internationally in tobacco control. Branding distracts so we're reducing the capacity of the tobacco industry to add a lure to smoking which we know is so harmful. So instead of having a pack which one part contains a graphic warning and the other contains nice happy imagery to distract from and try and counter the health warning, the other part of the pack now will be drab and dull and will help smokers pay more attention to the, to the health warning and hopefully make the health warnings more effective. It will also make smoking seem less glamorous and that should also help particularly in discouraging the uptake of smoking among young people. One thing I've learned throughout my career is that the acid test of whether a policy or a program direction is biting and biting hard is whether the industry kicks back against it. When you see repeatedly the tobacco industry spending millions of dollars in lobbying, direct advertising against particular policies, um, trying to influence political decision making, um, you kind of know that well, that means that those policies and programs are going to have big impact. The tobacco industry knows day by day, shop by shop, brand by brand, exactly the impact of different policies and programs because they're delivering stock to the retailers. They know exactly where it's been delivered, they know exactly how it's selling, and they know the impact of a price rise or a price fall or uh, new restriction on smoking or uh, the impact of a new campaign that's been uh, launched by the government or an NGO. So they're not just casually guessing what policies and programs uh, are damaging to them. They know. And so we ought to pay careful attention to that. And when they start screaming about things we're doing, 
we should simply do it even harder. This isn't just a matter of common sense, it's also a matter for very hard evidence gathering and academic research. And over the last three decades, consistent research has been done using multiple different methodologies, experiments, surveys, qualitative, quantitative, study after study, collectively all point in the same direction. There is no question the pack encourages smoking. The idea of plain packaging and research shows clearly they will have this effect is to increase the prominence of the health warning, to take away any sense of the, the product being attractive by beautiful design values that can be put into these packs, particularly with new technology, and to reduce, if not remove, any tendency for people to be confused about the harmfulness of smoking by, for example, use of light or pale colours to suggest, to hint, not to state, just to hint that maybe these aren't as dangerous as, as, as they might be. They are. All cigarettes are lethal. And smokers need to know that if they're going to make intelligent decisions. Plain packaging helps them to make those intelligent decisions. With advances in mechanisation in the, the late 19th century, enabling the mass production of, of cheap cigarettes, which made cigarettes affordable to all, which wasn't previously the case, tobacco companies had to try and create demand in the product. good like a cigarette should. Try Winston. And so packaging's been important for tobacco companies for, for a long time, but its importance has become accentuated more recently. We've conducted quite a lot of research on packaging over the last three years. We have conducted several reviews of the literature, uh, a number of studies in both the UK and beyond, but the findings all point in the same direction. Potential public health benefits of plain packaging. Governments have a moral obligation to protect the health uh, and welfare of their citizens because uh, lives are on the line and delay in action uh, means additional sorrow and all the economic consequences, which we are pretty good at documenting, frankly, but the personal consequences often uh, get lost in our research papers. The warning labels is probably the most obvious uh, deficit of the U.S. effort. We've been serving as the control group for most of the ITC countries. Our warning labels were last changed in 1985. When we talk about rotation, we rotate every you know, quarter century or so, and current efforts to try to you know, put on the uh, graphic warning labels of the United States, of course, is delayed uh, because of court actions by the cigarette manufacturers. It goes part and parcel with doing uh, public health in uh, the tobacco control arena today. Uh, the tobacco industry isn't run by tobacco farmers or salespeople, it's run by lawyers. I mean, cigarettes, uh, we know, are the number one preventable cause of disease and death. I don't know what we're waiting for, basically, to address the problem. I mean, people are addicted to these products. Addiction uh, literally hijacks the brain, and many don't make it until they hit rock bottom. And that doctor is telling you, sorry, uh, you should have quit sooner, uh, but now you got lung cancer, and it's probably too late. That is not the fault of those individuals who were, you know, hooked as teenagers. Uh, it's really the fault of the tobacco companies who engineer a product to uh, get you hooked, to keep you addicted, and uh, they know most of their customers would leave them if they could. Uh, that is, if the exit gates were ever to open, uh, almost all the smokers would leave overnight. Our job really is to allow those exit gates uh, to open so smokers really do have a choice.